I'd like to welcome everybody to the 20th annual Brattleboro Literary Festival and this morning's session, New England Poets. My name is Robbie Gamble and I'm a festival volunteer. We are excited today to present two award-winning poets, Peter Filkins and Jennifer Militello. Uh, I just like to um, put out a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. You can submit your questions to Peter and Jennifer via the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. If your question has already been submitted or, or something sort of like it, click the, click the thumbs up icon to upvote the question. There will also be links in the chat to purchase their books and to donate uh, to the festival. And a special thank you to our sponsors. And now I'd like to introduce our poets. First, Peter Filkins is the author of five books of poems, What She Knew, After Homer, Augustine's Visions, The View Were Granted, and a new collection, Water Music. Wow. He is the recipient of a Berlin Prize from the American Academy in Berlin, and has held residencies at McDowell, Yaddo, Malay, and the James Merrill House. He's also the translator of Ingeborg Bachmann's collected poems, Darkness Spoken, and several novels by H.G. Adler, and has published a biography, H.G. Adler, A Life in Many Worlds. Currently, he serves as the Richard B. Fisher Professor of Literature and Creative Writing at Bard College at Simons Rock, and is a visiting professor of literature at Bard College. Jennifer Militello is the author of, of the poetry collection, The Pact, and the memoir, Knock Wood, winner of the Zank Nonfiction Prize as well as four additional collections of poetry, including a camouflage of specimens and garments called Positively Bewitching by Publishers Weekly, and Body Thesaurus, named one of the top books of, of 2013 by Best American Poetry. Her work has appeared in Best American Poetry, Best New Poets, American Poetry Review, The Nation, The New Republic, The Paris Review, and Poetry. She teaches in the MFA program at New England College. And now I'll turn it over to our poets. Great, thank you, Robbie. It's very nice to be here and it's very nice to be reading with Jennifer. Uh, and I wish we could all be here in person. Uh, I'm coming re reading from uh, Western Massachusetts. Brattleboro is only, gosh, only probably an hour and 15 minutes uh, north of where I live. But so be it, those are the conditions under which uh, we currently exist. Um, I will be reading from uh, a new book of poems called Water Music. It has a slash between the, the two words. Um, also has Michael Zalahosky's uh, artwork on the cover, uh, which I had the opportunity to actually purchase after he, he was so kind to uh, lend us the image for the cover. Um, but the slash between the two words is really uh, to sort of indicate that I'm trying to ride the border between nature and culture. Uh, and I live uh, in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts, a very beautiful part of the world. And uh, while writing about historical matters, I also find myself drawn uh, to the natural world and to our place within it. Uh, I'm going to read the second section of the book, uh, which is comprised of 10 poems, which I think are sort of the emotional atmosphere or emotional center of gravity uh, of the book. They don't have a real narrative subject. They're sort of as I say, more atmospheric. Uh, and I, they don't re really require any particular introduction, so I will just uh, uh, name the titles and, and read from them. The first is called Obad, a morning song, Obad. The seagull kiting in a cage of wind navigates again its scry of need. Beyond the docks, the wooden boats, rough barbs buoying flight, toward an end to flight and gravity riding the wind. Little problem. Longing, we say, and by extension imply duration, we cannot stay. Caught as we are somewhere between the all apparent and what we've seen of storms, of harbors, the wind-chopped bay laced with white caps like macrame, slow to unravel and tattered seem knotted with longing we cannot stay ashore and this is a poem in three parts each with a subheading ashore map where we are going it isn't clear since where we are is already here 
aware the far, the far shore is a bit more near than first expected or was made clear by starlight guiding the course we steer blithely upon the cusp of fear of never knowing that it's clear where we are going is already here survey how deep is the lake as deep as it gets who dammed the river nobody yet which way runs the current, both east and west? Can you swim in it? Try your best. Has anyone ever drowned? A few, not all. Are there any fish in it, large and small? What is its name? Kettle in Mohegan. How long has it been here? A day and an eon. Does it freeze over, absent the sun? How long have you lived here? The water flows on census fishermen on the lake make no mistake and cast their line ashore fishermen on the shore want something more and strike the hidden middle the wide water waits mysterious and calm its depths built for drowning its surface always level willow amid the toss of light that breaks the rust of oak, pearl gray cloud cover, bellying rain, the willow lingers, pliant with weeping that is not there, and yet is what we know it by, among hemlock, among ash, beside the lake water that laps the rocky shore, as a heron unfolds its pageant slate above the surface, rippling bruise rain falling and falling cannot be a curse of becoming the blight of day aqueous free to trample hay cut for winter cut for winter or left to rot fields ferns fog bound weather perpetual as air or an error rot solstice that on this day of winter dark rain impelling the ribbed coppery flash of oak leaves the year should end and compel the mind toward the gravity of pines tremulous with wind hail blast and a moment marked as the sun draws furthest farthest away from the earth and seems to pause before returning nadir out of the air the air embodied settles as flurries down laden streets, soft declamations of silence unhurried, earthward their journey emptied of wind, lake ice contracting its vice of cold murmured music on which we skate. Narcissi, forced in February, six petaled stars crown these airy tall columnar stems inclining their heavy heads weary pining for a death attended not by the tremor of papery husks but starlit verdure at winter's dusk credo never complain the jonquils say blousy with breeze they cannot hold and the breeze itself, saturated, cold, dispenses torrent, torrents, a black cloud drained to quick exhaustion and the marauded plain of jonquils blazoned, never complained. And finally, nocturne. Suffice it to say, the full moon's hard light exposing the ambush of sea, invading the harbor, cannot, cannot know the concerted blast that cripples an elm to a stack of limbs. Suffice it to say, and say it to praise the burnished horizon, its color of rust, suppliant above the sea's reckless glitter, these meager stars piercing the scrim of moonlight proffered its silver its peace we'll turn to this next section which uh leaves uh the realm of nature uh, or at least returns to it in a different way through history and through art 
Um, it's a poem called Water Lilies, which uh, reflects on Claude Monet, who during World War I uh, painted his great series of, of the water lilies, but did so in his studio at Giverny, which was only 50 miles from the front lines. So while he was painting the water lilies, he could hear every day the bombardment of World War I and the trenches. Water lilies. Meanwhile, he painted them. Lilies floating on the surface of a pond he'd constructed for the pleasure of the eye and motifs to paint at century's end. The new one begun with multiple explosions of carmine, coral, white, fleshy flowers against the backdrop of a subsurface blue with distances. The sky stretched out upon the watery calm where a cloudy puff would later be captured by his brush in motion. Each day in the studio, another one spent to the echo of guns, bombarding the trenches, pummeling the sum, erupting in billows of char black smoke beyond a horizon no longer present, but subsumed, erased, immersed as he was in the flux of light on water flowers astride turbid shallows beneath a willow and its weeping our only perspective in a lost world lost to bottomless translucency the eye that sees it and the intractable sun <clears throat> soundboard this uh, was a poem that, uh, written in ireland um and uh repeats the account of a, of a story told to me in Ireland, soundboard. When Archie told me the incredible story of Lady Margaret's piano, an Obermeier plucked from a forgotten warehouse in bombed out Berlin, then secretly carted off, scarfed up by the allies and loaded onto a plane, delivered to Ireland only to end up the elaborate inlaid soundboard holding Peg's ashtray, her snooker of gin. Simply amazed, I couldn't stop thinking of Pasternak's piano tossed from a window, workman at his dacha deeming it worthless decades after his death, and the poem he wrote that warned his lover, the shivering piano will discompose you. Death is in the air. One opens up one's veins, much like a window. It's a true story about Pastor Max Piano. They actually tossed it out the window uh, decades later. Uh, it's a poem called Epiphany. A poet I very much admire is the uh, Northern Irish poet Michael Longley. <clears throat> and uh, I think you'll see why. Um, yeah. Uh, in the poem itself, Epiphany. I wish I could write like Michael Longley, flower besotted at Kerrigskiwam, where the birds' winged monikers still hover, chiffchaff, wimbrel, curlew, sanderling, near tide pools awash with otters foraging mollusks and snails to the peep of plovers skittering sea reach on slick back sand. And not this grab bag of eagles, muskrats, the heron's slate stillness unbending to strike quick as a thought, the length of pickerel now threading the dark of its S-curve gullet, a wad of cash in an old crone's bedroll, the heron, a woodcut, motionless epiphany. I wish I could write like Michael Longley. I did send it to him and he understood that it was really an homage. Uh, let's see where to go. Uh, writings. This is the last uh, section of the book, which again sort of returns to the quotidian and tries to find a kind of resting spot in the midst of history, culture, and nature. Writings. Swallows at daybreak, pure in violet sounds, the flit and splutter of their antic rounds across lake glass, dipping their tails, mid-flight and lambent, translucent inkwells left pooled and pooling toward the outer shore, a water pocked trail, their signature. Uh, this is, I'll read two more. Uh, this is called, uh, 
uh, Making Hay, and uh, actually is just out in the, uh, this month's uh, New Criterion. Uh, and it says for R.W. in memoriam, and R.W. is Richard Wilbur, who lived uh, quite near me here and was a dear, dear friend and, of course, a great American poet. Um, and so this is, in many ways, my elegy uh, for him. Making hay. Dotting a fresh mown pasture, they are abstracted. Lozenges of green, whose yield will feed a winter's hunger with a summer's field. For now, they sit there circumspect and salient as totems to another time whose sickles and sighs seeded the baler's times this sun-baked stubbled plain of timothy and fescue configured with each pass summer materialized in cylinders of grass yet absent the sharp inflections of blade on polished hone is there really any loss or is it dim nostalgia denying is for was? For it's hang that remains, patient, mindful husbandry, never quite out of style, so long as the scent of clover still carries a country mile to circulate among us, lost to screens and pixels, the freshet of this summer day, sweet with its own idiom, the musk green smell of hay. And finally, the last poem in the book is called Envoy. A burl of light on a pane glass window, cold drizzle, wet snow, eruptive weather. And this, our only legacy, to know the low hung cloud that glances off a mirrored surface, yet more real than the cloud itself, muddy April indecisive to the last, mimicking the slap of wipers back and forth across the slope of windshield, or oddly at the corner of Maine and North, that storefront window reflecting now the curve of heaven, the noxious exhaust, pedestrians astride, the polished glass, the cars rolling by, the dog on its leash. Thank you very much. Jennifer, I believe you will take. I am just trying to um, turn on my video. Um, so could I be made the host again, just so I can turn on my video again? Let's see if I, I'll try, I can't do it, no. Nope. Oh, there I am. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for um, being here this morning. And um, thank you, Peter, for, uh, for reading with me today. Thank you, Robbie, for introducing us. Um, and uh, thank you, of course, to the organizers of this incredible festival. Uh, it, it's, it's so wonderful to be here and it's always amazing um, to see the, the events that happen. Um, so I'm really appreciative of those of you who work really hard to, to put this together. Um, so I'm going to read just a few poems from my new book, The Pact, today. Uh, and I'm going to begin, uh, there are sort of two themes that run through the book. Um, there are some poems about romantic love and some poems about family, and it's really a, a book that highlights the complexities of love. So I'll begin with The Punishment of One is the Love Song of Another. At last I have found my assassin. At last I have struck gold. When my past hissed with cobras, you let me sleep. When I was falling, you brought the ground closer and made gravity of flowers like a kiss. One body moving is a seduction. One body is a practice leap and a parachute unsprung. Only the scalpel knows the passion of blood. We soothe it with cold and sing it to sleep. 
we leap at the chance to be blistered. We listen and stiffen, we pivot and reap. My rib cage could be a wasp nest built of paper. My hand could be the slip of sand across itself to slake the great unknown. Snow coughs along the windows now and listens differently to the pure. Snow brocades like cotton, prayers like burdens go. So um, one of the pieces that um, moves throughout the book is uh, family and the complexity of family. Uh, we all um, have family, so we perhaps all have experienced this to some degree. Uh, and this next poem is a poem that uses uh, Catholic imagery to talk about family. Um, because in some ways, uh, family and, and the love of family is a kind of organized religion. Um, I mean, there are so many pieces of complex love that are um, sort of cult-like and we're expected to take on certain roles. Uh, so this is lineage is its own religion. I was an apostle to the group of you strangers who had known me since I was born. I ate of your flesh, I drank of your blood, sipped the elixir of your moods, put the remainders in the tabernacle, wiped the goblet clean with a cloth. The crosses branded into the wafers were your voices branded onto my heart. I heard you live forever. I heard you rise. The bones of you yield to the memory of flesh and we count our blessings and also bless. We are bright in anticipation of death. We are living like fishers and set against waste and the taste is bitter left in our mouths. I am dying, I am dead. Lord of the losses, Lord of the faith. I take each breath and my chest expands. Now I stand knee deep in the muck, unable to move. And if I dip my hands in, they will fill with bracken and all the thickness of each formless face, kicking up stones until you are gone. Mythic lisp, the lip shape. One day you vanish like a flash confessions in a dark room, firmaments to read and spin like dice. I genuflect twice at the edge of your pews. I kiss the book for you. This is what the word of family can do. Sit at the round table, break bread. In the beginning, the loveless made the world and saw that it was good. So there are um, a series of sibling poems in the book that continue this theme of family. Um, and I will read Sibling Medusa. Um, as we know, Medusa was um, both monster and victim. Uh, and I think this also uh, sort of perpetuates that idea that that in relationships we are often um, taking on many roles and and um, performing and and behaving in many ways, uh, some of which are um, positive and some are which, some of which are not. This is sibling Medusa. In the pictures, the hair snakes all look the same, though I know better. Every snake is a different persona though all are out for murder. Every hiss is a criticism unfettered. Every head is a hatred on its leash. Every slither is a movement toward hurting me further like our mother. I learned long ago to only approach you from the mirror. Your scales overlap. They have the phalanx of your heart. All my shields crumble. All my winged shoes fail. You are my sister. My love for you is a ladder. I climb until I fall. 
There is a Red Sea in my blood and it is your mood, venomous at root, ever changing as a God. There is a Red Sea in my blood and I must keep it still as its tides would drown us, as our parents still hope we will break bread. We believed you were a priestess. We put you on the urns. We lifted you up and loved you alone. Now you are a monster and want me gone. Were I to carry it as a weapon, your head would turn on me. I am only one of the statues that surround your lair. All of our family is there, posed and still, paralyzed by your punishment, your scathe, your skill. Where I had my home, I am no longer at home. I was closest. I was in your crib. I was in your bed. I wore your clothes. I shared your name. Is this why you hate me? Is this why I now see the deadly inside red of a thousand stretched open mouths? Your serpents control me. Your eyes are voiced over. I don't know you. Where is my sister? So I will continue with, um, there is a poem in the book that was one of the first poems that I wrote for the book. And I was uh, at the MFA in Boston and I happened upon the, uh, the Enkisi Enkandi. And the Enkisi Enkandi is an incredible figure. Uh, when I saw it, it was one of those moments where I said, um, this is an image I would love to write a poem about. But of course, when that happens, you never know what will happen. It will maybe sit with you and you will never be able to write that poem. Um, but this was one of those fortunate times where I was able to do it. Um, it is a 19th century power figure from the Congo. And um, it has nails, iron nails that stick out of its shoulders. Um, it has these scratched glass eyes uh, and it has a um, sort of opening in its chest where seeds um, and medicinal herbs are placed um, in order to uh, sort, of, sort of seal vows and packs between people um, and to um, also take revenge. So it's this sort of magical figure that, that they believed uh, would seal these sort of pacts between people, um, but also would act to take revenge if those vows were broken. Um, so it was described as a kind of hunter healer of conflicts. Uh, and so the epigraph for the poem reads, this striking figure with its serenely rendered face and violently pierced body was made to contain and direct a spirit in order to assist people in need. And that's from the Art Institute of Chicago. So this is NKC and Condi. Hunter of murderers, of liars, of thieves, she loosens tongues, will not quench thirst, pierce her shoulders to make it start, scratch her glass eyes blind as bone. Placed inside her chambers, potent herbs, earth from graves, a string or shell. Activate her to punish or afflict, estrange her and an ache will strike. If a dead deer lies by the side of the road, she is the weeks of decay before it's gone, grinning jawbone dragged by wolves. Rest your head in her lap to calm your nerves, Place your mouth to her breast to let the dead go. Sew her name into the lining of your coat. Close her eyelids with a gentle thumb. She exhales until the wind blasts shingles off a house. Scrape her with knives to seal her power. Slit her with blades to awaken a vow. Way to call a lover. Way to cure the moon. She is carved from mortar and oxblood and wood. She is carved from water as it falls. Be destroyed by her image when telling a lie. Let each iron nail denote an oath. Her heart mummified jewel in the chest. Her fist is a lantern infested by dark. Her dowry is dust or blood on the lips. 
Read the entrails, swallow dirt, unbottle the cyanide gloom. The facets of this can be read like braille, unmask your hands from the past kid gloves. I'll just read two more poems. Um, this is Idolatry. My lover, butterfly on a pin, sickness in a church, worship that will stick, fuse that will not filament, grittiness to burn. My lover is the knife edge or half threat, the fire sip or godsend. My lover is the hemlock I drop in the glass, facts I can't believe, is a casino bet or a dog year or an early death. On his knees like his mistress wants, on his knees my master wins. We reenact the stations of the cross. We cry the way doves in mourning call. I want to bite so deeply he bears a scar. I want him to hurt with me as the cause. I want him to bleed secretly, silently, like a bullet hole that only seems a bruise. I want there to be no remedy or 911 call. Do I want to kill him? I can't be sure. But I want our small city preserved. I want a Pompeii of bones I can show off. I want destruction like a temple we can bury in ash. I want terracotta warriors lined up. I want mummies in chemicals lethal if sipped, scarabs in the chest. I want x-rays to find out how we were posed, what jars were filled, what water we poured. Through his cheek, a worm or root. Through his hands, a tar or frost through his ribs split by insects or weeds. I remember the tender O of his mouth. And I will end um, with a poem that was inspired by um, what happened in uh, the Jonestown cult. So, when we think about Jonestown, um, we think about it as a group of people who chose to be there and who willingly committed suicide um, and who drank the Kool-Aid, right? And we have that phrase, drank the Kool-Aid, um, drinking the Kool-Aid <clears throat> in our culture. And we use it um, when we talk about people who have been uh, sort of sort of fooled into uh, certain behaviors uh, or following without question. But the story at Jonestown is much more complex than that. Um, and when I started to research it, I really realized that um, that it, you know, cults are not as straightforward as we sometimes make them seem. Um, so at Jonestown, 909 people died. Um, many of them were children. Uh, Jim Jones had them sign uh, what were called compromises. So they were agreements that were blank so that uh, they didn't know what they were signing and they didn't know what could be put into that agreement so that when people wanted to leave the cult, they would be threatened by these compromises um, and told that they could be held responsible for, for an agreement that they had never made. Um, they also, um, took part in, in what Jim Jones called white nights, which were practice suicide sessions. So they would drink the Kool-Aid and, and not die. And so the people there drank the Kool-Aid over and over and over again, so that when the time came for it to actually happen, obviously they were confused about, um, about what, would, what was actually happening. And some of the people were killed by force. So there were murders that took place um, as well. And um, so this is If Our Love Were Jonestown. And there is a moment where there's a quote from Jim Jones, and, and I think you'll hear that. <clears throat> if Our Love Were Jonestown. 
We would sign our compromises, not knowing what they say, and in this way pledge to stay, and in this way create a cult for two. We would give up all we want and are, emptied syringes surrounding buckets of drink. The unwilling in us would be injected with poison or shot. The promise of joy would lead us. There'd be a house at the head of the hive of houses telling us what we thought. Children would emerge from the jungle with jungle in their eyes, with their eyes wide and hands crusted with dirt. Children would disappear into the jungle, their lips stained. We would rest beneath the churned up soil, among the empty cigarette packs, among animal bones, an arrowhead, torn carpet and damaged tile. Love would be 12 miles long and seven miles wide, the size of something that could have been real, but turned out to be a lie. Our white nights would be so white, none of us would get out alive. We'd endanger ourselves with what we believe, with how we follow, what we feel is our leader and the real paranoia. All the drills will have us thinking we'll live through it, but we won't in the end. Now I know I can trust you, my darlings. Go now, sleep tight. Tight is how we'll sleep our breath in our chests, nothing let out. They'll come around with stethoscopes to be sure we are dead. If not, we are shot, but we are them. We kill the children inside us first, and this is why we die. We want to belong. We perfect believing, we perfect trust until it kills the children, until it kills us. Thank you. Jennifer, could you please make Robbie the host? I've just done that. So apologies to those of you who are watching. We're having some camera issues, but we have it under control. So no, I, I, no. I'm not. I, am I host now? Yes. Then you need to make me host. OK, um, there we are. OK, <laughs> sorry about this, folks. Um, we are struggling with the complexities of Zoom hosting. And here comes Peter. Yes. Okay, Peter, if you turn your video on, we'll all be back on the screen. There we go. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Peter and Jennifer. Both those are wonderful readings, both of you. Um, and um, I, I would encourage people in the audience, if you have questions or comments, to, to, to uh, put them in, into the question and answer uh, thing. Um, and I will, um, I, I will... I will forward messages on on to our poets. Um, I'll, I'll I'll start off with a question. I, I've been I've been thinking about the um you know the, the heading for this this session New England poets um and and what does it mean to be a New England poet if anything at all and and listening to the two of you I, it's it's hard to imagine two more sort of distinctive voices to, to, to come under under that umbrella which which is a, a, a really wonderful thing. Although you know, New England sort of Im implies a certain uh, regionality, and I was just—I I wanted to put out to both of you. you know, so, what is your relationship in you know in your work with regard you know to you know being um, of this region or, or or working in this region? You know, the tension between the, the local and, and the universal. Um, I, 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 there was something that that, that that Peter said that would just said, you know the relationship that that his poetry has between history, art, and nature. And I was struck how that, that's manifests itself in such different ways in, 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 in each of your work. You know, I, I think of the, the, um, the, the Monet poem, you know, right, um, Painting the Lilies during World War I, and then um, Jennifer's poem, the, 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 the Nikisi Nikandi thing, you know, sort of looking at uh, her relationships through, through the lens of this you know, extraordinary African bronze sculpture. Um, so, I, that's, I, I, that's not really a question, but just sort of, you know, it's, it's, I, I wondered if you both wanted to sort of you know, re reflect on that range of things. 
I'd be happy to respond to this. Um, I, I have lived in the same house my entire life. Um, and my family has lived on the same street for over 250 years uh, in Western Massachusetts. So I, place is really important to me and New England is very important to me. Yet I've traveled, I've also lived abroad and in New York and you know done graduate school and, and things like that. But I, I, I found myself about two, three years ago uh, being sort of, as many of us are, sort of very upset with the way things were going in the world and particularly this country. But then I, I had, if you will, a, a, a small epiphany realizing if I could try to um, do honor to the place that I live in, that would push back against uh, the sort of uh, negative sides of history, which which impede and, and and invade us on a daily basis. Those are in are in the book too. The first section actually takes up. Uh, much more contemporary politics and issues such as the border crisis and uh, the 2016 election. But it, I, I try to move from that to a place of living in the world. And that that is very important to me. Um, and, and that doesn't mean being happy or content in the world. It means being engaged with the world immediately about me while reflecting on the world beyond me or beyond where I live as well. Yeah, I guess um, I would I would answer that similarly. Um, one of the things I love about New England is that it feels like it's very much on the edge of the continent. Um, and I always feel like I am close in some way to the rest of the world. Um, I grew up in Rhode Island, so uh, the ocean is there and um, standing at the edge of the ocean um, you're always sort of feeling the sense of, of continents beyond uh, where you are standing in that moment. Um, and I think that's in keeping with the sense that I have about poetry, that everything begins in our own perceptions and in the self. And then our job as poets is to connect the experience of the self with the larger universe. Um, and um, and that's, of course, one of the things I've loved as a reader is feeling connected to others and to other parts of the world through um, the reading, especially, of, of course, of poetry and translation. Um, but I think also there's so much richness in terms of um, art and, and imagery and, and so uh, it's so wonderful just to be able to, to think about how what you witness and experience can be translated through, through metaphor, or through description, um, and how these connections can be made. So, um, you know, Rhode Island was such a tiny little state, and I grew up with that sense of that tiny little state in, in a larger context, and, and that's how New England feels as well, right? A small a small little area in that in that huge context. So you have all the benefits of of the beauty of of this incredible place, but also the fact that um, that it is in that amazing context. So thanks. It's, it's I will just add, it's also a, a region intensely rich with writers. Um, I drive past M Melville's house every day on my way to work. Uh, Emily Dickinson is over the hill. Frost is over the hill north of, of here, and and you know Stevens isn't that far off. Um, uh, so you just have this sense of uh, being of a place, but being of you know sort of having roots ties, uh, meager as they are, to to American literature and American poetry. It's just, it just goes deep, deep, deep here. Peter, could you please make me host? Yeah, sure. Oh, we've lost Robbie now. Rob, we've lost Robbie's audio. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that was that was my fault. I, I was muted. Yeah, I, I'm thinking. To, you know, we think of American literature as being a relatively young tradition, um, but in New England, it, it, the, the the history of it goes 
deeper and, and further back because you know there, people were here, here you know your Europeans were here for, for longer um and I, I I was just I'm really struck by by how both of you you know look at the history of things whether it's recent stuff like Jonestown or or um I, I keep, I, I'm never going to be able to look at that wallet, water lilies painting again without thinking of <laughs> artillery in the background. It really, it's a, such an interesting paradigm shift. But um, um, I was wondering if you both wanted to sort of talk a little bit about your relationship to history um, and how it, how it infuses what you do. Jennifer, you want to go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I feel like. I feel I feel like my sense of history is most connected, of course, to literary traditions. Um, so that's a little bit of a, yeah. I've, I mean, I've been so dedicated to to poetry and literature for for such a long time. Um, and as someone who's from a family that only came to America. Uh, you know, one or two generations before me, it, it's interesting how, how sort of complex that feels um, as someone who, who has, um, you know, such close connections to Italy and to, and to Greece, um, and who had, had these, these family members in Brooklyn who came over and were sort of working these, you know, these jobs that were very much sort of immigrant jobs and and um, so so I guess when I think about how I am connected to to history you know I think about myself as as a person sort of being connected to those ancient traditions ancient Roman and ancient Greek traditions um, which I've always loved and I guess that's why they surface so much uh, in in the poems I write so um, you know, there, there's a lot of Greek mythology that that I use, um, but also, of course, the history of New England. Um, but I also feel like history, you know, when I think about the way that that writers make use of what has come before, um, I think about the way that we use things metaphorically as well. Right. So. Um, so things that have happened that reflect on the larger consciousness of our experience as people, um, again, are sort of sort of brought, being brought forward and, and related to us. And when I talk to my students, I, I'm always like, Google and find stuff out and do some research and steal some language. There's so many amazing, you know, the minute you you get to a place where you can use something historical, as with the Jonestown poem, which you mentioned, you have a wealth of, and, and with the NKC and, and Kandi poem as well, you have a wealth of, of language. So um, I do feel like there is a deeper emotional root to that, but also there's that more superficial desire to sort of go and mine for really interesting um, imagery or language. Um, you know, the measurements of the Jonestown um, you know, living space and, and, you know, that list of things that you'll find in the ground there, these are things that were actually found. Um, so it's, you know, I hate to be so like, I don't know, so superficial in my relationship sometimes to, to historical happenings, but sometimes it's just really great stuff with lots of really great language. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I love to re read history and I, and I have since I was a child. It's my, probably my favorite genre to to read and and I certainly read read it to to uh, see what I can steal from it um, and what what I stumble upon in the in the course of it um, I think also you know a poet that has meant a, a great deal to me is Seamus Heaney um, and and his ability to see history in uh, you know in the in the farmyard that he grew up on um, to to that sense of the local and the, if you will, the universal being, being connected, um, I think frees one up to, to write about, again, the history that is right before us, or the history that has, that has preceded us, or the history that is located elsewhere. I will add my work in translation has connected me very, very much to uh, World War II, the Holocaust, and post-war, post-war Germany, so I have a, a 
deep sense of of the scope of of history and those subject matters as well and that that probably uh, transfers to, uh, to a historical awareness in the poems. So I'll, I'll just note that the, 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 the chat has been opened up um, to our audience now and we have, there are links up as to where, uh, so where, where you can order um, the books um, from these authors. Um, there's also a listing of our festival sponsors and you know, if you feel so moved, there's, there's a link to um, a donation page to help support them. The, the festival. Um, I don't see any any questions in in the um, question and answer box right now from the audience. Um, but I, I I would if you do you, do either of you um, wish to respond to um, the other's work at this point? And is there any, any, anything in particular that? Well, I, I will say I was very struck by the use of mythology in, in Jennifer's poems, and and I wonder if you. What what distinction do you make between history and and myth or mythology and history or or what what is the particular attraction of mythology for you? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I guess what I love, um, you know, when I think back, I think of um, some of the images that were in the books I had as a child of mythological. Um, in particular, I think about the, the image I have in a book that is the Hydra and Hercules um, sort of burning the heads one by one. Um, but I think, you know, th there are differentiations obviously between myth and history. Um, but what I love is that we go to both of them with an attempt to understand um, why we behave the way we behave and, um, and how we sort of, again, sort of connect with one another um, and what we can understand about our own individual scenarios based on the sort of larger, um, you know, larger sense of that. I have to confess that um, I have a terrible time with Greek myths. I cannot keep them straight. This is a, uh, <laughs> if you will, my Achilles heel. Um, but I, you know, who is who is Hera and, and which? You know, who I just can never keep those stories straight. Um, and I think so. I, if I were to answer my own question. I think I'm trying to turn history into myth, um, be it the water lilies, the, the the kind of epic, to turn that small moment of of you know Monet painting in his studio into a larger canvas, a larger epic of art, art versus war, quite frankly, um, and and so I think that's what happens for for me. That's because I have no problem reading history and keeping lots of historical facts straight. That's I find that very easy to do. Um, but hand me a Greek myth and I'm, I'm halfway through it and I'm, I'm lost. I, I just, I've never been able to keep them straight, even though I love uh, Homer and, you know, the, the Euripides and Sophocles, obviously I'm very steeped in the liter the Greek literature, but Greek myth has always been a, uh, a weak point. Can you talk about translation in relation to these pieces? Because I think, you know, I'd be interested to hear about translation versus your own original poems and how that translation is connected to your sense of history. Yeah, translation it, it, um, has ex just, just expanded my writing life uh, to much larger than it probably would would have been. Um, it, people often ask me, does, you know, does Ingeborg Bachmann, uh, uh, has she affected my, my poems? And the answer is no. I mean, I have this little Ingeborg Bachmann voice that I can turn on and turn off that I, that obviously I've <laughs> constructed. Um, and same thing for H.G. Adler. But just, I would say, I, I have to understand the one word in German, but I've got to have a dozen words in English in order to make my choices to translate it. So it's just naturally expanded my, vo my vocabulary. Um, and I think that shows up in the poems that, that uh, particularly as I've gotten older, um, my, my wife criticized criticized me for bringing in too many fancy words uh, in, into poems, but I, I don't mind doing that. They just, they're, they seem to be more at my fingertips uh, because of, uh, frankly, you know, 35, 40 years of, of translation work. On the historical level, I don't know how to 
answer that. I think it's more, like I said, the, the writers I've translated have dealt with some pretty big historical uh, cataclysms. And so I think, particularly in writing a biography was, was fascinating. H.G. Adler was a Holocaust survivor, uh, was in Tradition Stadt Auschwitz and two other camps and, and made it through all of them. So that deep dive into what happened in order to, and he was an unknown figure. So I had to tell his, his story through the times. It's not like if you're writing a biography of Freud, everybody knows who Freud is. So they just want to know more about Freud. I had to find a way to, to sort of put him on the canvas of the history of his time. Of course. I, I think we're, we're at a, that may be a nice place to close for today. Right. Um, and I really appreciate both of you, both of your readings, both of your reflections on your work and, and this region and, and history and, and art and culture. It's been, it's been a great way to, great way to start the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robbie, and thanks to the uh, Bernabeu Festival and uh, to, to uh, Shard Denord and all the hard work and organizations got into it. I know it's very hard to put all this together virtually. And thank you, Jennifer. It's nice to read with you. Yeah, thank you, Peter and Robbie. And thank you again to the organizers. And thanks to those of you who came out this morning to spend some time with us. Have a great day and rest of your festival, everyone. Thanks. Bye now. Bye-bye.